Good evening. Um, thank all of you for attending. I'm uh, Professor Elwood Watson. I'm a professor <laughs> of African American Studies, History, and Gender Studies at East Tennessee State University. And we're here this evening to talk about the panel, um, Mad Men, and multiple perspectives at looking at Mad Men. And this evening with me um, are Professors Joe Lane, Joseph Lane, who is the chair of the Political Science Department at Emory Henry College, and Julia Wilson, who is the chair of the Sociology Department at Emory and Henry you know, uh, College. And both of them have been so kind to come down here this evening, on this beautiful September evening, which mm -hmm. it is, truly, truly is, <laughs> to come down and participate in this panel and to talk about uh, Mad Men and the you know uh, phenomenon, and I think that's an accurate word to use, that it has become in the American society. And uh, we hope that we'll be happy to take any questions afterwards, entertain any questions that you may have for us as well. As well. So we're gonna get started. Um, Mad Men to me, what do you think of Mad Men? What was your interest in sparking, what was sparking either Julie or uh, Joseph, what was your interest in sparking Mad Men? What really got you going into Mad Men? Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> what, what really got me started in being interested in Mad Men is actually just happenstance in that I was coming back from a trip, I think, out to California from a conference, and Mad Men happened to be, one, the first episode of Mad Men happened to be um, one of the options that I could watch on the way back. So I watched it because I thought this sounds more interesting than you know anything else, Shrek or whatever was on TV. Um, and of course, by the time I watched that first episode of Mad Men, I was hooked. I was hooked because you know my field of study is also gender and sociology, and the first thing I thought of was feminine mystique, feminine mystique referring to Betty Friedan. Um, and the character development is so complex and so intriguing that I really thought, I've got to watch more of this series. I've got to see how this develops. Indeed. Uh, well, um, Dr. Wilson and I are married, so part of it was she was like, "You got to watch. You got to watch this." She brought this home. It was, you know, it was date night for <laughs> yes, us. Right. Yes, you've got to watch this. Um, I also, uh, I'm in a political science department, but I write a lot about politics and literature, particularly, usually print literature, not popular literature. But uh, being in that circle, I was asked by a friend of a friend to, to sit on a panel and respond to papers. And the panel was on Mad Men just when political scientists were beginning to take seriously the political implications of, of uh, popular television in general and Mad Men in particular. She said, you really need to watch this. And if you be the commentator on this panel, then you know I'll buy you a suit, which I, I'm still waiting for my suit. I thought you know, I was going to get one of the, the cool suits from the show. But she encouraged me to. Uh, uh, comment on other people's papers on the show and that and that kind of was a gateway into me to, to be well prepared I felt like I had to sit down take date nights with with Julie and watch uh, all the episodes I guess at that point in time that was episode uh, in season three watch up to the current uh, point and as well as getting to see what some other scholars were doing with the show which was kind of exciting right. and saw some good papers and that that was a great opportunity to kind of get introduced to it for me yeah. well for me it was um, I was curious about the show, and actually, I came into it by uh, just uh, happenstance, circumstance. It was a, the first, the very first season aired on a Thursday night. That's what I remember. On AMC, it came on Thursday nights mm -hmm. at ten o'clock, and now it's on Sunday nights mm -hmm. <laughs> at ten o'clock. But I just had to be switching through the channels, and AMC was still relatively new. You'd heard a lot about it, and I said, you know, well, it looks interesting. Robert Bianco of USA Today had done a lot. Uh, he'd done a critique of the show, and mm -hmm. he gave it four stars. And this is not a man that gets a lot of television shows for stars. So therefore, I said, well, let me look at it. Also, I do a course on the 1960s, post-World War II, post-1960, and Cold War is my area. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I already, already had a natural curiosity about the show. And when I read the review about the show, how well it was done and how I looked into it, I said, I'm going to check this out. And as you said, after the first two episodes, I was hooked. I was like, this show <laughs> is fantastic. I said, it, it deals with the elements of race, gender, class, alcoholism, mental illness, homosexuality, child, children, I mean, had every element there. Right. Anti-Semitism, you look for it, there was every element, there was, uh, you know, all these uh, issues were being looked at, but from a 19, obviously a 1950s, 60s perspective. The very first season started off in 1959, mm -hmm. and the very first season itself was the very first episode, the very first scene, as you probably remember, was very, very intriguing. It is Don Draper in a restaurant talking to a black busboy. Mm -hmm. and uh, talking about cigarette ads and cigarette purposes. So it, it kind of right then gives you an indication of what the show, 
these, the theories of the show and pretty much how African Americans and women and others are going to be uh, uh, portrayed throughout the series. Now, several years later, and several seasons later, into the, we just concluded this past season, 1966. Right. So I think when season six starts, it's going to probably go to Matthew Weiner is very, very protective. He's almost, they say he's almost paranoid about anything, know anything about his scripts, so he doesn't divulge too much information. That being said, mm. I'd say probably season six is going to probably start toward the latter part of 1967. Some of you think they're going to go straight to 68. I'd be more inclined to believe they're going to probably start at 67, because 67 was a very, very important year as far as the hippie, summer of love, right. and the drug culture and all that. So I think it would be very, very uh, too much, of a, given what's going on particularly in New York City, I think it would be a too much of an important time to uh, ignore, even if they start at the very end of 67, I don't think they're going to just totally uh, ignore that year for that reason. But how I got started into Mad Men was because of the, I looked at it and I saw, you know, the, the, uh, how it delicately dealt with the issues, whether it was subtle or not, of race gender, all the issues and team courses and areas that I'm interested in writing about and teach. <laughs> so therefore yeah. it was a very, very, you know, intriguing to me as well. Great. As well. So I and I think that's what I, that's how I found, that, that, that's, what, that's what got me interested in the show as, as well. Uh, we all, all of us right here too, uh, all three of us, have written an essay uh, in the uh, latest anthology, and I think to my knowledge, the latest that has come out about the, uh, in regards to the show, and it's called Mad, uh, it's called Mad Men, Women and Children. Uh, gender and generation, and the editors of that anthology are Nancy Batty and Heather Markovich, who both teach at Red Deer College in Canada. But they are the ones who were um, who uh, came up with this idea. Um, although I'll hint, hint, I did give them some. I, I was one who was kind of you know pushing <laughs> go, them go, to go, do go, it go, to go, do go, it. Right, do right. it. Yeah. Right. And they do acknowledge me in the introductions. I appreciate it. <laughs> but I was when I said you know they had they were PCA. We met at PCA last year, 2011, right. at San Antonio, and they had three mm -hmm. very good papers looking at women and mad men. And I said, why don't you guys, y'all should get together and do an anthology on this. I said, because you already got three good essays already right now. And they said, well, you know, we didn't even thought about that. So we went out to dinner and all that, you know, and mm -hmm. the following nights later, and um, the rest is history. You know, we able to get a contract pretty quick. And as we know in academia right now, given book, uh, the book publishing industry and everything right now, it's not as easy to get contracts as it used mm -hmm. to be. So, yeah. but the fact that we able to get a contract, particularly for a collected edit, edited volumes, there's a snobberism toward that. They, uh, they were able to do it. And um, because of that, you know, uh, there's another uh, contribution to at Mad Men. This one's strictly look, primarily looking at gender. Uh, the essays I've done primarily, uh, Joe and Julie did theirs on pretty much uh, marriage, children, and family values in Mad Men. Mm -hmm. uh, my essay looks at Carla, who was the maid on Mad, Mad Men. She was the black maid, uh, played by actress Deborah Lacey. And I look at that and how Isla Mines looks at the point of her character and the issues of race and the intersection of race and gender. and. Um, class and how that it turns into. And Joe and Julie can talk a little more about the essay that you put some of the elements that looks into yours. Right. So okay. as well. But uh, we also look at we also look at this show from a number of levels. First of all, before we go any further, how many of you obviously you're here, so I know some of you are in my class, but I mean <laughs> 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 and we talked about it last so, week. So, so, but, so we got a reason. <laughs> but but if those of you who are not who are not in my class and don't know me as Professor Watson, um, I assume you have some Knowledge of Mad Men, am I correct? Or you know, um, you know, uh, how many of you have seen the show or regular viewers of the show? Just a show of hands. <laughs> okay, you know, okay. So it's obvious that some of you, are, you know, certainly know about the show. And how many of you are just curious about the show? <laughs> you know, okay. So, <laughs> That's you know, good. Academics love curiosity, so that so That's that good. That, uh, that is watch good. it. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. definitely watch it. But no, Mad Men in many ways. Uh, the, the show, I think, in many ways, and certainly, uh, George, you can follow up. The show has been very, very good. Season one started off primarily to fill in for those of you who are not familiar with the show. Season one looked at uh, 1959. And it also looked at, you know, the character. The main character of the program is uh, Don Draper. Don Draper is a very, very successful advertising executive who works for Sterling Cooper. Sterling Cooper is a Republican-oriented uh, advertising firm in Manhattan. And they are very, very uh, waspy. That's the best way to put it. You know, they're very waspy. Uh, they're very, very, you know, uh, conservative in nature. Everyone there dresses in suits and ties and in the beginning, in the early part, and therefore, you know, women know their place, you know, the, the, the women, there's a head secretary named Joan, who keeps everybody pretty much in line, you know, she's a senior sec secretary of all the other ladies, and she over oversees their behavior, make sure they don't get out of line. She's very sexual, she walks around in the very, very tight uh, dresses, and everything like that, and exudes that sexuality, and she's been an object of affection, uh, romantic attention from Roger, who's also another character on the show, who's uh, 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 ex -Korean, Korea, Korea veteran, uh, extremely uh, waspy in nature as well, and he's but he's also very very uh, xenophobic. Uh, Don Draper has a lot of private demons himself. Don Draper has a drinking problem. He has a womanizing problem. Um, he doesn't seem to have too many 
racial problems, though, or at least over, at least if they're not, because people of color are not in his world. So therefore, and this is kind of evident in the fact where he speaks to the black bus boy without, right. in 1959, whereas the, uh, the man who comes up to them and says, is this is he bothering you? So-and-so can be very talkative. And Don goes, no, as a matter of fact, I was talking to him. So he yeah. tells the other, tells the, the owner so many ways to get lost. But I want to get some information about cigarettes. Now, he's more interested about how the, 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 the then term Negro, the Negro market, and what cigarettes right. they pursue and like that. But he doesn't really have any problems with race, really, in general. He doesn't have a problem with you know, but keeping staying faithful to his wife, Betty, uh, Betty Draper, who's a former model, uh, played by actress January Jones, and she represents kind of what you talked about earlier, about as, as Julie says, about the feminine mystique model. I think, and it's clear that Matthew Weiner has modeled that there because she's yeah. kind of the housewife in suburban Austin, which is upscale, and that's where the feminine, that's where Betty Friedan lived, I believe, if yeah. I'm mistaken, in that part of the, of the country in 1960, you know, in the early 1960s, and she's kind of a woman who's very miserable on some level in the sense she's not really happy. They don't necessarily have what you call what we would have a happy marriage. I mean, it's successful as far as material, Don's a very successful man and he gets these great bonuses and they can, money's not an object, okay, so that, it's, it's, it's successful as far as his financial success and they're living comfortable and they don't have to want for anything. Um, but it, 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 there's a lot of emotional voids within the marriage. None of these people are really, really happy. He's not happy. Uh, nobody that works at Sterling Cooper, if you ask me, seems to be really, really happy. Yeah. You know, I mean, they seem to be very, very, you know, well-paid people, but they're not very, very happy. And I'll give a rundown to the list of characters before we get a little further. Um, Betty Draper's his wife. Don Draper's the main character of the show. She's a housewife. They have two kids, Sally and Bobby. Later on, another kid comes along and, and as well. They're father, two, two kids at that time. Uh, then they also have Roger, who also works at. He was a Korean War veteran and uh, as a like. You have Pete Campbell, who is a younger guy <laughs> who really Don has not much too much use for. He's, again, he epitomizes waspy behavior and waspiness. Not necessarily what you call an admirable character in many ways. He's very, very, people are people are okay to him if they're useful. <laughs> That's the best way to put it, I would say. He's manipulative, he, you know, he does, he's unfaithful to his wife, so to speak, but, um, and he's not what you call necessarily an alpha male in many ways. He's kind of a very, very emasculated male in many ways. I think he's kind of insecure about his own masculinity, mm -hmm. in many ways, to be, to be blunt. And I think he's somewhat intimidated by Dom. And um, it comes to a head in one of the episodes where he tries to blackmail Don, or he certainly tries to force Don out, which uh, fails. But he's definitely sees Don. Uh, he tries to make inroads with Don. Don really has any use for him. I think Don has this class issue going on. He's wealthy now, but he comes from a fake identity. Dick Whitman's is a fake uh, original identity, but he also comes from the other side of tracks. And I think he's worked his way up and has done well. He's a head, you know, uh, advertiser uh, agent there. And there's still, I think, some class resentments there toward Pete. I think he thinks Pete's one of those guys let me all that's kind of had a silver spoon in his mm -hmm. mouth and kind of had a, had a charm life, so to speak, whereas he had to literally, literally scrap <laughs> to get where he was. Right. And I think he has a very little patience for Pete or people like that in general. Uh, and I think there's, and I think he's kind of, that I think has a lot to do with Don's disdain toward a lot, toward a lot of those people that work there because most of those individuals uh, are there. And Pete's another major character. Joan, who I just mentioned, uh, played by Christina Hendricks, she's the office manager in there as well, and um, she's a major character uh, within the show, and Betty and Pete, and those are the main, then you have secondary characters like Ken, played by Aaron Stanton, he's a writer from Vermont, comes from a wealthy wasp black mm -hmm. family, decent guy pretty much, I think he's very, very, not too many problems with Ken, he's, he's a very <laughs> decent guy, very likable, very much more likable than Pete, you know, mm -hmm. but, but just pretty much a decent <laughs> guy, smart. then you have a guy who's not on any more in the early seasons named Paul, uh, who was kind of the resident, the, the resident liberal, Bohemian type liberal, quote unquote liberal of the uh, of Sterling Cooper. He would always, you know, he lived in Newark, New Jersey, which is where you know the southern, the work integrated side of play. He lived right. in a lower income section. He would always let people know he lived in a lower income section of town. He had a black girlfriend, Sheila White, who was on there for the first couple of episodes as well, and um, he was pretty much the resident liberal of, uh, within the, uh, the, uh, the. Then there was a, a character named Sal, uh, who pretty much was the person who was a closeted gay man. And that comes to a head at the end of episode th season three. Uh, he's the man who, in many ways, is um, living that double life. You know, he's in constant fear that he's going to be found out. And Don does find this out because they're going to trip together, so to speak. And he rebuffs this man. What happens? Sal's demise comes in at the end of season three, where he um, rebuffs one of the uh, a, a rival, a, a co-advertising agency who wants to do business with him. And the man, he refuses this man's advances because he tells him I'm a married man. But yet, Sal has no problem having a, a relationship with the bus boy. I mean, the, yeah. at, at the hotel. Yeah. So the guy gets upset, and, and as a result, he um, 
accuse a Sal of sexual harassment, where Sal was not, in this particular case, did not sexual harassment. That becomes the end of Sal's situation. Don already knows about Sal's uh, behavior, or uh, be, uh, private double life, and, and, and an effort to not tarnish the industry. You gotta realize this is 1963, 64. Right. That's not going to be acceptable, particularly for a conservative advertiser, even for a liberal one, probably, but a one that prides itself on republicanism and Nixonism, therefore they're not, therefore he's pretty much dismissed, and right. that's what happens there. I think one of the interesting things, um, particularly thinking about Mad Men, Women and Children, which was sort of the title of the book, and, and the first several seasons of Mad Men is the way that the 1960s gets unmasked as a period in which almost everyone lives a double life. Yes. Sal's double life is obvious as a closeted gay man who, who has to get married, has to put on the front of living the life that's expected of somebody who's going to be a successful advertising executive in the 1960s in spite of the fact that it doesn't really suit him. But, but he's, he's hardly the only one. Even the most traditional um, members of, of the crew at the advertising agency at Sterling Cooper have to live double lives in some sense because there's a front that's expected of society in the 1960s and there's the truth about what they're attracted to, what they think of themselves, what they want to become. Sometimes it's very innocuous. Ken, one of the advertising agents, um, uh, quietly is publishing short stories under other names. He, he really wants to be a writer. He doesn't want to be writing this copy for you know uh, little advertising uh, slogans. He, he wants to be writing real literature. Um, and yet, there's a great deal of embarrassment and, and even professional threat, maybe not on the highest of levels, but professional threat to being outed as somebody who thinks of himself as a writer. Um, it opens you up to ridicule leads people to wonder whether you're really serious about the agency, whether you're really serious about the business, leads people to wonder whether you're um, just looking for a way to make a paycheck until you could get out. All these things are things that Ken's really hesitant to let out. Um, and, and some of what we have worked on, uh, Julie and I worked on in the first couple of seasons, is, is how the um, gender roles lead to these double lives in, in terms of people's desires to appear to be perfect mothers um, perfect housewives. Well, and to and and I think to have the perfect marriage. I mean, Joe mentioned at the beginning that we're married. Um, it's really interesting to, you know, we lead a double life too because we're both scholars and we're married to one another. So we can't actually sit down and watch any television show without putting on both masks. Um, <laughs> but it's been, you know, one of the things that's interesting about watching this as a married couple is your awareness that, to a certain degree, that's still true about all of us in real life. That we have different side, different um, as Goffman would say, you know, we present different aspects of ourselves in different parts of everyday life. Um, and so um, watching the show is interesting because it makes that explicit. We can all see that. We see the double life that Don Draper and Betty Draper um, and, and everyone else leave. And, and this, is, this is a little bit of an aside, although it is that double life. One of the things that, that is important to mention, uh, may seem superficial, but I think is actually really important to mention about um, particularly Don Draper and Betty Draper in Mad Men is how absolutely beautiful they are as people. Don, and this may, again, it may seem shallow, but I think that it's not. And the reason I think that it's not is that um, Don, you know, Don Draper is truly, the, the actor that plays him, John Hamm, they, they, John Hamm himself is not as handsome as Don Draper, and I don't know how they manage to do that with makeup and the way they characterize him. <laughs> but they are truly beautiful people, and therefore they really look from the outside with their beautiful selves and their beautiful home and their beautiful children like the absolute archetype of ideal American life. So much so that Betty actually gets a modeling gig as a mom for a Coke commercial because she is so beautiful and so so exactly that ideal, this blonde, you know, slim, gorgeous woman who happens to be your wife. And so so that that's another aspect of that double self that even we get to see that even these supposedly beautiful and wonderful people actually have their own demons to hide and their own um, their own problems to bear. And I, I to me that's a very important part of making making Don and Betty the women in this show are actually for the most part quite lovely. I mean Christina Hendricks who plays Joan is this is very I don't know if you all have seen pictures of her she is not the slim beauty. She's very voluptuous with, you know, real curves. And she is, you know, we all want to look like her. At least I do. Um, probably more than Betty. So the women, not so much. But the men all pale in comparison to Don. And I think that's actually deliberate. I think that's deliberate on the part of Matthew Weiner to show him as that sort of ideal man who becomes so much less than ideal over the course of the series. Yeah, and I think that's the excellent point to go on and build on. I think, I think, and I don't think it was by accident that Matthew Weiner chose Don Draper to be the character to look the way he did, to be so no. much more 
uh, attractive compared to most of the men on the, of all the men on the show. Uh, now Joan's husband would be considered, you know, uh, 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 her fiance, yeah. well, ex-fiance would be that. But the, the men who are none of those men work at the advertising agency, no. so they're a brief interlopers. Right, different. and particularly what I was thinking of, you were talking about the contrast between Don and Pete. I mean, it's so interesting yes. because Don, Pete has what maybe Don doesn't want but envies which is that sort of life with the silver spoon and obviously there, throughout the whole show you see this theme develop of Pete who's kind of this nerdy kind of weaselly guy I mean that's, if, if, yeah. if that's a way to describe him I mean you can exactly. see his envy of Don Draper develop um, throughout the entire series is how he's continually trying to emulate Don even as he's trying to overthrow Don him is the, the man agency. he wants to be you know, he is absolutely you know, the man he wants to be and I think that's part of the reason why he behaves the way he did with Elizabeth and other absolutely. people I mean, because absolutely. he definitely he's, he's, he sees Don as the, you know the head on, and he wants to well he actually wants Don's position <laughs> he does what he wants but, he, but he's one of those kind of people that I think he's Don is the man and I think for some other people they're not a, not to the degree that Pete does but I think Don is the a man he wants to be and if you look at advertising magazines and things in the 1960s uh, and commercials and stuff there were men who looked like Don Draper those, yes, those, those, that's how men did look at that and Betty you know Ivy women who did the Ivy commercials and stuff they were the blonde haired beautiful yep, women absolutely. Like that. so I think Matthew Weiner has certainly done his research and done a good job at, you know yeah. emulating that if Don Draper was even a tall man but let's say he was even blonde hair, let's say it was about 20 pounds thinner or wasn't, you know, as appealing. I don't think he would have, let's say if Roger had been Don, the main character, mm -hmm. I don't think the show would have had the same level of, um, And plus he's gray, so that, that you exactly. know, true, yeah. Something, so I think the tall, yeah. with the term dark, tall, dark, and handsome. And mm -hmm. I think that, mm -hmm. and I think that played into, and I think Matthew Weiner deliberately crafted this out and, and to where, and, and to where he wanted this, uh, where he wanted this to go. But I think it's also important to look at the, the characters, which is, like I said, some of the show's uh, images that it looks at too. Also this time in the early seasons, it does flirt with the issue of anti-Semitism. Yes, it does. I think it looks at it, you know, uh, because <laughs> Don's involved with him, who who who's Jewish, you know, what a couple of girlfriends, well, your mistresses, you know, because he's married, or you know, Jewish women, and, and that, that kind of comes up in the, in the talk, you know, he finds that they're Jewish, and it's not an issue. Again, it's not an issue with him because he doesn't seem to have these problems of anti-Semitism or race that some of the people around him and that you know, the advertising agents really do. You know, they really do have problems of you know issues because um, uh, but they, uh, again, they they seem to have much more, particularly some of the characters like Harry. And you know Harry Crane, the, yeah. uh, who's kind of the stout the guy wears glasses, so to speak. He's uh, he's socially awkward anyway. And Don doesn't hesitate to show his dislike of yeah. him. He doesn't like him, but he's openly, you know, he makes it openly bigger, like, bigger the comments and the like. But again, race doesn't seem to be an issue with Don. I think Don, don't get me wrong, I don't think Don is what he's not what you call out there advocating for civil rights. But but he doesn't. Would he care if a black person worked at Sterling Cooper? No. As a matter of fact, this last season he came on and said, you know, well, I don't see why we just can't hire one. You yeah. Know, he was he's one of the there. And Lane, who's British who just un, uh, unfortunately committed suicide. He's not gonna be on the show anymore. Lane Price, he was a British savvy ad advertiser. He uh, was very, very shrewd. He's from Britain, therefore I don't think he has, and this is 96, he doesn't have that same baggage that American of, of American racism that many uh, native born Americans have. So I see he doesn't see, if anything, he's very, very shrewd when it comes to marketing, you know. Right. Um, and Pete, uh, for all his uh, frail, for a problem, he was the one who was very, very, he's very, very, he's smart when it comes to some marketing, um, Aspects. He's the one that pitches the color right. television mm -hmm. ad, Admiral Television ad, you know, and um, yeah, and the first thing that um, when the, his boss comes, he goes, you know, he goes, you really saw this, you foresaw this, didn't he? Because he was talking to Hollis, the elevator operator, who's one of a few black characters on the show, who comes in and I'll tell you this racism. He's he's one of the few black uh, uh, characters on the show. He's the elevator operator. His name's Hollis, and he uh, handles, you know, he works at, works as Sterling Cooper's elevator operator. And he asks about, he goes, it's uh, and it's clear that Hollis doesn't want to say too much to him. He goes, it's okay, I'm talking to you, you know, it's right. okay. He's like, because he, he he didn't want to, he was afraid to even step out. Of line and speak to uh, you know Pete because that just shows you the environment we're working in. And Pete asked him about you know um, what are Negro viewing habits for televisions you know and da, da, da. and then that was um that that, that became a, a marketing ploy which tried to be pretty 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 successful. Now people like Roger and then make fun of Pete and call him Martin Luther King Jr. you know and all this type yeah. of stuff. But Pete has enough sense to realize that um the power of money is green and he definitely wants to um yeah uh, Owen actually has a great line in in uh, his essay where he says that the the uh, only color that matters on on a certain level is is green. You know that the um, and the advertising firm wants to make money, and and I wonder if both of you all might talk a little bit because it's not something that comes up in either of our essays as they're written in the book, but maybe somewhere that um, you can really think about the 1960s is in some ways trapped between the market dynamic developing in the United States and the the social dynamic of kind of the cultural weight of where the United States had been and the history of slavery and all these sorts of things that had happened in the United States where you know, cultural bias, generally speaking, um, uh, is antithetical to the logic of the market because what you do is essentially lock people out of participating in consumer culture 
to a certain degree, and those people could if, if they had jobs that allowed them to do so and social access to the places where they buy them, buy things, and buying things makes money and you want to make money. And I think you see in some ways in the 1960s one of the tensions that's tearing at this little advertising agency and tearing at society as a whole is, is this tension between the desire to make as much money as possible and the desire to conform to the social norms of successful white personhood in the United States, which means I don't break bread with certain people, I don't go out with certain people, I don't associate with certain people, or work for certain people. But boy, if those people would buy things, you, you see Don and Pete sort of testing that, don't you? I mean, you know, couldn't we sell this to somebody? If they're willing to buy it, why wouldn't we sell it to them? And then the older partners, in a way, resisting, no, that's not what you do, right? Is that, is that one of the real rifts in the firm, do you think? I think it's a little different in a sense because um, it, 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 you deal with the cultural issues as well. But uh, the, I think also the issue that Matthew Weiner is showing, who is Jewish himself, uh, there's certainly anti-Semitism there and there's racism, but the difference is that Jewish people are still in the picture somewhere. Blacks are not even in the picture. Right. Jewish people are still, there are Jewish advertising agencies, and some of them, they grudgingly feel, they realize, remember season two, one episode, that they knew there was going to be the best opportunity to, to do business with this Jewish advertising agency. They didn't want to, and anti-Semitic slurs started flying in that room. But the point was, well, they, they came, out, came back down to money again. Well, you know, this is going to be our best opportunity, so we will reluctantly, quote unquote, hold a nose, unquote, then <laughs> we'll deal with these Jewish people. But because, you know, we, they're going to be our best interest. They came back down to money. And I think that was where you saw uh, 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 in that case. And also, they were willing to do that. Now, would they have done it with a black advertising agency? And how many of them would have been in New York City in 1962 or 63 anyway? Probably. Two of that many. You know, they probably would not have dealt with well, agency. But also, the cultural stereotype of, of people who were Jewish at that time, of course, is not that people, you know, people who are black or poor at that time and, and aren't mm -hmm. going to have those resources and people who are Jewish are going to have financial resources. So I think there is a way in which that cultural bias works to support that involvement with the with the agency. I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so, but I think you're right, too, that there is a sense at which, you know, they're willing to sit down at the table with that group in which we don't know what the outcome might have been if it had been African Americans or other other groups at the same time. So well, um, it is also, it's also a very interesting point. One, him and Roger having lunch in one of the episodes, I think it was season three, uh, and Roger, and Roger makes a comment. He goes, you know, uh, one of the, uh, I forget the name of the advertiser. He goes, they just hired their first Negro. Or he's, he's actually, Roger yeah. is the word colored. <laughs> and uh, uh, Roger, yeah. and quickly, Ro uh, all Don goes, well, I wouldn't want to be that person. And just, and it, yeah. nothing, nothing else was said, but it was clear, you know, at that time, he, he made it clear that, you know, probably, it, but it, the, the message was in 1963 or 62, you know, being the first black at advertising AT, you know, that probably wasn't going to necessarily be yeah. an easy road to go, you know, right. so was, and you better be able, you better be on top of your game. Right. So. And yet, and that the irony of that, and I guess he can say that at that time, is that one of the really intriguing characters in, in Mad Men is his Don, the woman who be, is Don's secretary, brand new secretary, um, graduate of, you know, one of the 60s secretarial schools. Her name is Peggy Olson. Um, and Peggy is this turns out to be this great character in Mad Men because she starts as a secretary and she really has all these copy editing skills and so Dawn is willing to recognize her and then eventually she moves into a copy editing position and she, not Pete, becomes actually the second Dawn in the agency. Um, but she is that first woman. You know, she's not the first African American, she's not the first Negro, but she is the first woman at least in that agency and really almost, you know, throughout Madison Avenue. And so we get to see that developed through Peggy's character, what it's like to be, you know, in 1961, would she have been, would have been her first year? Yeah, right. I mean, which is, you know, just a year before I was born, not to age myself or anything. Um, but the sense of what it would be like to be that person, we get to see her experience, you know, Wiener's version of what a woman in her position would have had to encounter. And it's really, mm -hmm. you know, quite, re quite remarkable. And she's um, also to Catholic too, which oh, is yeah. also, there's little, oh, yeah. there's little rumblings you know they don't talk about that as much because Catholics are not it, not not ostracized okay, yeah. much, but they are. They she, but there's there's movement. There's a, there's frequent references to her Catholicism in, in the in yeah. the in the because um, the Catholic priest played by Tom Hanks' son. Oh, that's uh, right. And a couple of the early episodes comes in, you know, and they and they, you know so 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 Matthew Weiner does a very interesting job in how he subtly looks at religion and stuff. And the women of Mad Men, speaking of women, that's actually these essays that we talk about. We you know, deal with women, Mad Men. The women are the backdrop of the story in many ways, whether it was, you know, uh, Sheila briefly, Paul's girlfriend. In the early part of this couple seasons, she had more notoriety than anybody else. She was kind of, you know, Paul's girlfriend. And she was kind of the object of curiosity around the office. She's an African-American woman. She's the object of curiosity around the office. And Joan, 
actually insults Paul in many ways in the sense that um, she tells him, you know, she goes, um, you know, you're just falling in love with that girl to, to show, to prove how interesting you are. You know, like, he goes, and she goes, I bet those conversations must be intellectually profound or stimulating to the point, you know, which is kind of condescending on her part. And he does, you know, he, he takes resentment, resentment at that. And, um, but it's clear that um, he backs out of a demonstration when it's time to go down to, she wants right. to go down to Mississippi. So it kind of shows the limits, even, even though uh, Paul, because prides himself on being a liberal, and I kind of talk about this in my essay, he's liberal to an extent. He, is he going to take that next jump to jeopardize his own livelihood or anything like that? No, he's liberal in when it's not, is liberal when it's convenient for him to be liberal and when it's not going to cost him that much or even makes him feel right. good about himself psychologically. But is he going to take that, is he going to take that, 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 that liberal step like so, some of people in the South at that time, like whites in the South who actually did put their livelihood and things in jeopardy, marching with black people and putting their, you know, their livelihood. Is he one of those kind of liberals? No, he, he, he's going to be liberal from a distance. Right, you know? right. And one of the things I think um, Elwood really points out beautifully in his essay. He writes about Carla, who is the um, domestic um, employee of the Drapers. Um, and that, in his, at his analysis of Carla itself is really brilliant. But um, the other piece that I think he points out so well is the smugness of, of Northern whites in terms of thinking about the, the issues of race in the South. And um, Paul's particular experience being, you know, whether or not he's going to be willing to go, I think is really, um, really illustrative of how it, you know, certain whites would have responded and you know I can say that um, uh, since I was alive in the 60s but also um, of how it also reflects our own response to issues of race even today and I think that you do you do one of the things I really liked about your essay is really kind of pointing out how the show actually challenges its viewer to think about race in American life both in the 60s but also today and sort of this trope we have of southerners being racist and northerners being egalitarian. And that's why I love about Matthew Winter because he yeah. does a brilliant yeah. job exposing um, fault lines. Fault lines. Because yeah. for the most time most of us when we see when we, at least when I was growing up and I grew up in Delaware which is a very very Northern Southern state, <laughs> half the state Southern. We're southern Northern state. It's one yeah. of the, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, half the state is literally Southern in the sentiment, and half the state is pretty Northern in the sentiment, and that's how it was during the, during the, during the Civil War, uh, the Union and Confederate sentiment. But he does Matthew Winnie does a fantastic job, of, I think, of exposing racism, you know, there and anti-Semitism, and not just, and also even more right. so upper class because we've always associated poverty a racism with poor whites or lower income whites he shows the upper class it's almost like that movie far from heaven where it was a good example where you see the he right. see you see the upper class anti-semitism and upper class racism now it may not be the same kind of Ku Klux Klan, you know, or were poor whites historically when it came to racism were more like involved in doing the dirty work, so to speak, or the physical mm -hmm. confrontation. But it manifests itself in the comments and the, oh, and in some ways even the self righteousness. I mean, for example, you know, um, they almost see themselves in, in the comments. They make, they see, they don't see themselves as racist. They see those Southerners, those Confederate people down below the Mason Dixon line. What is going on down there in Birmingham is terrible. How could those people do that? How could they bomb these churches? I mean, and they genuinely feel that's atrocious. Nobody's going to say bombing a church and bombing those children. Nobody's going to. You know, regardless of whether they're ra even racist, would not the people would, would definitely say to, would not condone that. Right. But the point is, they they see that racism as you know a southern phenomenon, but where they don't realize they themselves are right. just as bigoted, and they may not use the ethnic slurs and things like that. But the point is that, and, and in some ways, they're even more dangerous. What's well, it? Dangerous? It, problematic is a better word to use. More different. they're more problematic because they're they're actually contributing to it. You know, um, nobody has ever asked Betty, how come there's no black people living in Austin that we know of? You know, right? You know, you know, there's, there's, how many black people live in Austin, New they're York, or si the neighboring town, Syosset? And you know, they yeah. got friends there, but you know, they could they can come and work there, but they're not living there. You right. know, that'd be the first one to point out. Well. We don't have those kind of problems in Birmingham. You know, you know well, you may not, we, we don't have those, I mean, they're, they're like they have down in Birmingham, you know, the, the Selma, the southern cities. But they, don't, but they, I mean, I mean, are black people really faring that much better in Austin, in New York? Are they faring that much better in, you know, Nyack, New York? Or are they find that much better in Burlington, Vermont at that time? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, but, and, I mean, if anything, you know, those neighborhoods are balkanized by, you know, uh, then they're going to basically say, well, we're not going to tell you you can't live here. But the economics going to be so so expensive that you cannot live here. Right. <laughs> so it's almost right. like you know. So in that sense, they do a good, uh, you know, a very very good job of that. I think you know the 1960s. We haven't seen the whole 1960s. I kind of I, I hope uh, what will happen. Supposedly there are two more seasons to go. Right. Is that we'll see the 60s as an arc. It starts at, right at the end of 1959 on the eave of of 1960 and will end sometime in 1969 right on the eve of the 1970s. And, and I think one of the most incredible um, constructions in American television history is this idea of, of watching the 1960s through the eyes of an advertising agency. Because an advertising agency is about appearance. And 
What really happens in the 1960s, uh, as historians have shown very well, but a, but a lot of people aren't going to go read academic histories of the 1960s, is the stripping off in some ways of appearance. Lots of fault lines that were always in American society, it's certainly been in American society through the greater part of the 20th century, had been very well hidden. And they could stay hidden in some ways because we were, before World War II, such a divided up nation separated from one another by geographical space. That geographical space took time to, to, to cover. You couldn't easily go from New York to the Deep South to California and back and forth. And there were some people in certain circles who, who saw the whole country, but most people didn't. They saw their little part of it. Mm -hmm. And they saw the people immediately right. around them. If you lived in Austin, New York, what you saw was what happened in Austin, New York. And maybe if you went to work downtown, you'd see what happened in Manhattan. But in the 1960s, we're coming into a world where all of a sudden you see the whole United States, where all of this is, is coming into view. This is a great opportunity for an advertising agency. So in one sense, you're looking at this group of people who are coming up with the country. Mm -hmm. Television's going to blanket the airwaves. You see the whole country. You see what's going on everywhere. It's this most remarkable moment for advertising because the national market really emerges. But on the other hand, what advertising tries to do which is to show sort of this glossy exterior of what we wish we were, can't hold up to the tensions of a nationalized United States. All of a sudden, everybody's dirty secrets are coming into public view. All the things that people don't want to talk about or want to isolate with people who are not like us, who are far away from us, who have nothing to do with us, are coming home. Um, the great scene at the beginning of visit season five um, where they're having the, the, the protests, uh, the civil mm -hmm. rights protests on the sidewalk right outside the no, advertising. No, season, season six. Yeah. Season six, yeah. Right, right at we'll the beginning that. of the very first episode, protests, people marching back and forth for racial equality right outside the advertising agency. And, the, and there's a certain amount of giving these people a hard time, but there's also sort of a certain amount of amusement, like, you know, this isn't the South. Why, why are they marching here? I mean, what's... And they actually throw water at them, you know. Yeah. The water what's you wrong know, with New York? Why, why do we right. need to have a protest here? Right. And they actually, and that's, <laughs> I think that's a very powerful scene in many ways, too. It's a brilliant opening scene. It's the very first episode of this past season right. where they come in there and um, they watch up. I think one of the water balloons hits a little boy and the boy yeah. comes up there and they come up, they march to the office and say, there's water being, and they, tell, they go, there's water, somebody, people, somebody from your office is throwing water balloons right. out there. And the woman goes, that's not possible. We don't behave like that here. That's what the secretary says. <laughs> this is not going, and then the little boy comes in with water and they were, then she sees when the, the guys, the guys come running laughing with you know, with right. water in her hand. She goes, oh, okay, like, you know, she didn't, she didn't know what to say then. And, she goes, and then when the black woman there goes, need I say any more? And she goes, one of the lines I thought was brilliant, she goes, and they call us savages. And I right. thought that was priceless. I mean, I thought oh, yeah. that line was just really, you know, that kind of set the tone for the, um, and then the following episode, at the very end of that particular episode, uh, uh, um, I think it's Peter, somebody comes in with an African artifact. Mm -hmm. And somebody satirically places uh, out of uh, places an ad for equal opportunity in the newspaper, in, in the, the newspaper. And then the next thing you know, um, uh, uh, they people take the ad seriously. And there's a whole office of African American, then the term Negroes in the in the office waiting for jobs. So and Lane goes when Peter comes with that ad, he goes, "Did anybody see you?" This goes back to Lane, Lane shrewdness. Did anybody see you coming with that artifact? And he goes, "Yes, I'm doing a whole." I, he goes, "Well, then we." And then Don goes, "I don't see why we just can't hire one." That's the same episode where yeah. Don makes that comment. Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Well." Lane thinks on the speech as usual. He goes, "Okay, we're going to take resumes. We right now need a secretary. No men, you know. You know, we don't have any any availability for the men. But you know, the ladies can use your, you know, um, ladies feel free to leave your resumes, right. you know, and da da da. And then the very next episode, there's a woman by the name of Dawn who's on the show now. She comes in and she's the first black secretary, Sterling Cooper, and." Um, the first person actually really, I think of the guys, but a couple, well, she's Don's secretary, so he's obviously talked to her and, and briefed on what she needs to do and how to work for him. But about the other guys, the very first, ironically, the poses there is, Hen, is Harry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says something that's kind of very inappropriate. He goes, well, you know, all of you kind of look alike to me, you know, so yeah. to speak. And she handles it, you know, very, you know, it's in 1966, so she's, not the, she don't, she's obviously not going to say too much, being female and black initially. And... Um, you know, she handles it very well. Now, her and Peggy, uh, speaking of Peggy again, Peggy seems, you know, um, finds herself in these situations. Peggy's also a character, for those of you who don't know the show, Peggy's an individual who has a tendency to, um, she's kind of eccentric. She hangs with a lot of bohemians and a lot of people who are, you know, people who would not necessarily work at Sterling Cooper. Now, Don and them know about that, but she's so talented and good at what she does. You know, they, I think they have one of those kind of things. We don't care what you do in your private life as long as it doesn't affect yeah. what goes on here. And a lot of her friends tend to be the people from the bohemians and a few black people here and there. So the fact that she would be the one who would be a, befriend Don would not be all that surprising. Right. And because of the riots that are taking place in Harlem and things that like was going up in the 60s at the time, uh, Dawn stays overnight in the app because she's afraid to walk home. You know, she calls her people and tells them she's not 
knock on home or, 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 or where she ever lives. And uh, it just happens to be that Peggy's working late that night. And then she opens up the door, and you know, and, uh, and Dawn screams, and Peggy screams, <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> <laughs> like this. So, and she goes, "What are you doing here? It's just ten o'clock or whatever night." She goes, "You know, I, I decided to stay here because of you know, right?" And then Peggy goes, "Well, you can come with me. You can come with me." And she goes, well, "I don't want you too much trouble." And then make a long story short, she ends up going to Peggy's house. And they stay overnight and they talk about, you know, right. there and everything else. Now, there's one scene, though, I think that's kind of a, where the blogs really talk about this. Peggy leaves a purse there and she looks at it for a minute and then looks at Dawn and then she doesn't say anything, but she eventually takes it with her. But I think the writers purposely do that for the tent, you know, to bring a, build a little bit of attention right. tension there because she likes Dawn. She, let her, she trusts her enough to stay over there to her house that night, you know, as well, you know, but, you know, would she. Trust her with her purse. Would she, yeah. would she steal? And right. I think that, that's also earlier that those stereotypes Matthew Weiner periodic brings us back earlier in the season with um, her, 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 her uh, um, Betty's father. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Carla, the maid at the time, uh, they, she's looking, she helps him look for the, and I talk about here, she looks for, helps him look for the $5 bill. He goes, well, how come you look at me? He goes, I didn't accuse you of taking it. And she goes, not yet. You yeah. know, so, yeah, so there's it's still those, still those underlying time. stereotypes right. about black people in kleptomania or black people stealing and those type of things are there. So I think that is really another factor that kind of, um, you know, how he deals with race. And the people, the show has, and, um, the show has been critical, people have been critical of like a lot of black like racial issues and others have saying that Mad Men doesn't just the show the issue of race enough on the show. They do my take on it is just the opposite. I think he does a very good job of addressing race because he's showing how black people are marginalized at this time. You're not going to see, as I said earlier, you're not going to see people of color working at Sterling Cooper in 1962. At least in pre-1965 America, you didn't see the first black secretary right. in 1966. They're not going to be there outside of clerical work and outside of janitors and reporters. They're not going to be there. So, And black people like Carla are going to be, their answer when they're spoken to, and they stay out of the way. And they're just not going to be involved. In, I mean, they're not going to be involved. They're not going to be, these people in 1962, 63, even wealthy blacks for the most part, although there are some who did, they're not going to be involved in, in these world, these Republican world. conservative right. people. You know. Right. Well, and I was going to say, I think it, one of the things, that, well, the reasons why I like it as a show is because it doesn't beat you over the head with either race or anti-Semitism right. or gender. It instead, they, they, they actually deal with it, I think, in the way that most people do in their real lives, which right. is to move forward, but in a very slow and not always, you know, linear and progressive pattern. So you'll see, you know, when you see the character of Peggy in there and you see Peggy moving up, you don't see it as, yes, you know, everybody's going, yay, we're a champion for Peggy. You know, they problematize what's going on and they see, they make, you know, they see Peggy going through some struggles and Joan going through struggles with Peggy. And I, it's almost like an onion. I mean, they're revealing things happening layer by layer. And that's what makes it, you know, a compelling piece of drama. And it's also what makes it good as a cultural um, uh, cultural item to help us deal with some of these issues that we face today. Because let's face it, that's how we deal with things today too, in our real life. You know, as academics, you know, you know, Elwood and I both write about gender. You know, Joe and I write about similar things as well. We may talk about them in academics, but it's not like I go sit around the well. I do sit around the house and talk about gender a lot, yes, but that's because Joe's married to me. But you know, I don't go and hang out with my friends and say, well, let's talk about gender tonight. You know, oh, can you see all the women? I do sometimes see all the women are hanging together, but you know. And please don't ask me what color kitchen towel I like. But you know, other than that, there, there, it, it's very, and that's why one of the reasons I think it's appealing is because it's authentic, not just in its description of the '60s, but in the way we are today. It's a modern version of the '60s, and thus it helps us address. And it also things. shows the conflicts that women have with each other. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think it and that women have with themselves. Right, I mean, right. You know, yes. I used to think yes. this about Sex in the City that all the four characters, each each woman had a, each of those four characters inside of her. You know, all of us has that. You know, sexual temptress and Samantha. Samantha, we're all a little bit Carrie, we're all a little bit, um, oh, Miranda. I can't think, Miranda, you know. But the same is true here, right? I mean, those are the conflicts that women address, at least I would say, and this is more anecdotal, within themselves, even as, um, as you know, they're dealing with it as characters with one another, and they each embody something different about the struggle that women had over moving and continue to have over, over taking a place in a man's world. Not so man's world anymore, but you know, still there. So. But at that time, oh, 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 I'm sorry. You you alluded earlier to the to the feminine mistake, and I think that the the tragedy. I mean, in some ways, the the, mm -hmm. the among the harder tragedies in in the show is the struggles of Betty Draper, Don Draper's wife oh, yeah. at the beginning of the show, later ex-wife, who, in a way, is shown as desperately wanting to live up to a 19 early 1960s idealization about what a a white suburban housewife is supposed to be. She wants to dress the part, she wants to do the part, she wants to raise the children in the right way, she wants to do, and she's really working hard at it, in some ways quite contrary to her own personal talents and skill sets and her own personal inclinations, and yet um, making herself miserable at the same time. There's a, there's a uh, heart-wrenching moment in the ninth episode of the first season 
where having gone back out into the working world, having modeled for a little while, she then comes back, I'm going to stay at home, I'm going to do my job as a wife and a mother, and she starts the day in just this cheeriest mood and, you know, um, just loving the idea of spending the day at home, taking care of her children, all these sorts of things. And then Wiener gets this shot just of the clock, just the clock, a long shot, and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, how long are they going to linger on that clock? It's quarter to one. Then they show her sitting in a kitchen chair, staring out the back door, slumped over, smoking. And she just sits there, and the shot lingers on that. And you're like, she's wow, been at this you know. for four. And that's what you think. I mean, because some of those, some of those, I, yeah. I, yeah, and I think just some of those, I mean, really, if you have, you have <laughs> if those who have not seen the show, I mean, some of those episodes are just, I mean, they're just gut wrenching drama. I mean, just yeah. really, really. I mean, it's like when you watch it, I mean, a couple of episodes, I've actually, when the show's over, you just had this, like, Oh my wow, God! I used yeah. to, you, know, you just sit there for a few minutes, like this is a this show is heavy. I mean, I mean, it's like it's not it's not it's not a show that you tune in just to feel good about yourself. It's not it's not what it's got. It's not like yeah. the Big Bang Theory, you know, where you expect to be amused and stuff. But I mean, these shows they deal some really really heavy, you know, drama. Yeah. You well, know. what, what I think is good though about uh, they they do you know really what what I think Betty Draper portrays it for those of you who have read or are familiar with the feminine mystique is, you know, the embodiment of the problem that has no name. You know, this notion that I'm supposed to be here and I have everything and a woman is supposed to want and I'm not happy. What also this show does well is to show that Free Dan's solution to that, which was namely, you know, every woman should have a life of her own and a job of her own, is also not the perfect answer. And she does that, I think, through the eyes of Peggy Olson, because we also get to see some very gripping scenes of what Peggy's life is like as a single woman in New York. The scene where she, this season, where she announces to her mom that she and her boyfriend are going to live together. Right. You know, and her the way that her, her mother responds to that. Some of the things when she goes to tell her parents are very, again, it's very good at addressing the issues that we have now, even as it helps us think and reflect on, you know, the 1960s and that past um, that we were in. And I think that's particularly beautiful because in, in that sense, it doesn't just simplify problems into something that happened in the past. It's really getting us to reflect on what's happening now as well. And that's one of the things that we kept when we were watching it together and maybe next time we'll have to have a date night with Elwood I don't know but you know we'll we'll you know we were looking we just kept saying that over and over and over again we were seeing those things in every episode and we continue to see it in season five you know the, the episode um, the, some of the episodes are just incredible dealing with masculinity so you know we're but we're academics so we have to make everything into some sort of academic well, I also think good. I think yeah. it, it also deals like I said in many ways does a very brilliant job of looking at you know the uh, yeah. the issues of um, uh, men at that time, and to be more specific, because like I said, the men of color are pretty much out of the picture. But it also shows the the the, the, the arrogance of I think of particular people like Don yeah. and um, how they treat women. I mean, yeah. I mean, oh, I think yeah. the, the behavior of women is wrong. One here, the behavior of women in the show is just really, really. Um, Women are uh, uh, literally, le well, legally to a degree, in some cases, they're literally second class citizens in the yeah. eyes of these men. Roger doesn't have much use for women. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the, none of them really have use for women. Just have sex with you. That's what I mean. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the basic. I mean, women are sex objects for most of them. You know, and um, and, and um. But basically, not much more well, well seen in well regard than, than blacks, for that matter. I mean, you know, in different ways. I mean, but they're, you know, they do have the women. They they have the white skin, and that's about it. But outside right. of that, they're not held in high regard. Women are just pretty much sex objects, and that's it. And I think that's a message that he kind of sends throughout the show. You know, women did not necessarily have it all that great either. Now right. he has a lot of shows, a lot of writers for that short females. So I think they do get, it. and I'm sure some right. of these people probably talked to their mothers and people would have been women of that generation. Probably the, the, the mothers would have been writers. But I'm saying that, but he does a good job. That's why I think the show is brilliant historically and how he shows how women. Have been marginalized and how you know people color been marginalized and how um, people have had you know gay men couldn't be who they were you know right. at least publicly openly or you know or uh, unless they went to the, the, the parts of the city and the village and all those places you know and just lets people know where anti semitism was still there and I think the show does a very good job uh, in many ways a brilliant job in, in showing that and also it wasn't these things are not necessarily new. You know, multiculturalism didn't necessarily start in the 90s. New York has always been an ethnic and diverse city. Right. You know, even since the early part of the 20th century. You know, you always had, look, you had Chinatown, you had Little Italy, you had Germantown, you had all these places, you know. Uh, these, the, what he's saying is, all the difference was, as Joseph was saying earlier, these people may not necessarily have come into contact with each other. But when you talk about this, the, the, the view, what happened was the brilliance of television. Television came in the 1950s, and all of a sudden you could not live uh, and be, uh, you could not live the lie any longer. Right. You know, and I think that's why a lot of people resented the civil rights movement in many ways. Right. Because, you know, Martin King Jr., there had been civil rights movements prior to the 1960s. You had Marcus Garvey, you had David Walker, you had Frederick Douglass, people who advocated for civil rights long before Christmas Addicts and the Revolutionary War, long before, uh, and women, my Stewart and others like that, before Martin King Jr. came along. 
Martin King Jr. had the advantage of television. Right. People saw Martin King Jr. on television. They saw what was happening with marches and stuff. And Martin King Jr. and people like that used television very, very effectively. In 1963 and 1933, they, like this episode I'm talking about here, you wouldn't have heard about the Birmingham. You would have heard about it, but you might have got it two or three weeks later. It, yeah, and it would, you would read it in the paper, but it would not have been the same as actually seeing right. that burnt, that church and those little girls being taken out in stretchers over, covered over. That had a powerful, that resonated very powerful with people, and particularly women. I can imagine women of any race looking at that saying, but for the grace of God, that could have been my children. Right. Okay, I mean, I think a lot, I think that women of all races. And rumor had it that Jackie Kennedy, uh, the president Kennedy was president at the time. She told, I mean, these are, you know, there's nothing concrete there, but it, 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 this wouldn't be totally surprising. She told uh, her husband, Jack Kennedy, the president at the time, John Kennedy, she didn't care whether he got reelected in 1964 or not, but he better do something about what's going on down in Birmingham yeah. because she, I think those, I and mean, I think that probably bothered a lot of women. I mean, it bothered Betty to a degree in here, you know. Right. Like, I mean, to see, you know, they figured these people bomb churches and killed little children at Sunday school. These people would do anything. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, not, not to sound sexy, but I think a mother had that wit saying that could be no, my no, child. No, no, I think that's that true. That could be my, you know. And, and I think one of the things, the, the way the show sort of drives this transformation in American society home is really a, a smart narrative tool. Um, it's not just that we as academics who go watch a show say, you know, this is happening at the same time as that. The, the show incorporates this and is, is built for this in a very clever way. You're constantly walking by the radio or the television that That's allows true. you just for a moment, it cues you, where are we right now in American history. And they do this over and over and over again with, with um, the, the Birmingham, with bombing, the bombing in Atlanta. They do it with uh, the Kennedy assassination. They do it with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. All of these things are things that are kind of glimpsed into the show by the fact that somebody's doing something else, but there's a television in the room, and the television is telling you about the showdown, you know, in the Straits off Florida you know, as the Russian ships are pulling up there and are, are, are they going to turn around in front of the, the blockade? You know, the doom that you're supposed to be focused on in the show is a doom about what's going to happen to this advertising agency, but looming over it is this other doom that's looming over all of us and that you now can see on television for the first time where you've got somebody on television telling you the ships are 15 miles apart now, they're 10 miles yeah. apart right. now. You know, and, and, and so it's sort of, you know, forcing you to recognize what's happening in the foreground as metaphor for what's happening in the background. Right, right. Wouldn't you also say the show is very Victorian in many ways? I mean, I think when some people say it's puritanical, I would argue the show is probably more Victorian. Pick the characters. I think I would say they're more Victorian than puritanical. They're certainly not puritanical. I would say no, 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 I would say no, no, much no, more no. Victorian, particularly oh, Betty. So and, you know, I think it, um, and the, because um, one episode in season two, um, as Joe was saying, Becky, uh, uh, Betty actually, has an affair with a stranger, pretty much a guy. And you remember this in season two, the second, to the last mm -hmm. episode. And I think in many ways, um, it's the I think it's the classic example. Many of them um, are more Victorian. It's almost like you know that, that hypocrisy of it in the Victorian era. Right. You know, doing, yeah, it's you not know, puritanical. Is there kind of that, that kind of uh, you know uh, airs? You know, they they speak one way and behave in another way. And I think the show, and I think that's kind of another example that Matthew Weiner does throughout the show. Shows how these people tend to live double lives, but. A lot of times they're best friends because there's really no loyalty among these characters and things like that. I mean, you know, their, be their best friends tend to be, you know, Betty with uh, uh, Glenn, the boy. I mean, yeah. not, I mean, her behavior, I mean, it's almost like she was behaving with him in a manner that, you know, would totally be, a psychologist would say at that time, would be very, very inappropriate. You know, you know, he, she allowed him to see in the bathroom right. and, those type of, and, and, and those type of things. Whereas with um, Don, his, a lot of his best friends, the people he confides in, tends to be strangers along the way. I mean, Don might be at a bar, right? and he'll end up talking to some hobo or a man who's a, a woman, whatever, and he'll have a two-hour conversation with this person. I mean, these episodes, yeah. and talk to them more about things, reveal about his private life that he wouldn't even talk with Roger or anything else. I mean, so it seems like these people tend to be, and with Peggy, these, it seems like these people, and Pete, they, they're the people they tend up to be or confide the most in. Or tend to, you know, or people tend to be their better friends. Tend to be their, either their maids or their, or the, you know, strangers along the way, so to speak. It's almost like the, the Jack Kerouac novels on the road. You know, I mean, it's like they come and these people that tend to, you know, to right. be giving the most best advice tend to be the people that are not even in their inner circle. Which I think Matthew Weiner does that deliberately too. Oh, absolutely, because it lets them hide themselves. I mean, they don't. They, there's no risk. They can immerse there's themselves. No risk in it. Right, and they, there's no, you know, there's no risk in, in revelation to these people, and, and there's no risk that they're going to be that information's going to be used against them. You know, it's almost a form. It's almost cathartic for them. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost a form of therapeutic. You know, I think, and I, and I think, it's a, and I think that's again, like I said, the show is just. I mean, it's a very brilliant show as far as you know, looking at all those elements of psychology and all those things that, um, uh, in general. Uh, any any point? Any other points about the show we would like to bring up at this point? Because I think so. I, I wasn't. I, no, I was actually. I'm. I'm 
really curious if, if it's appropriate. Um, I'm really curious about you know what people questions people yeah, can have for us and sure. what what you know thoughts you all have about the show. You know, as those of you who are viewers, as well as those of you who are like, I don't know, do I want to watch this thing or not? <laughs> Maddox and not Maddox. They call Maddox and not Maddox. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm only in season two right now, but. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's so much. That's more okay. To go. We'll try to hold down the spoilers. Um, so I just noticed, like, I was wondering about, like, if you guys could speak to parenting style each time, because I've seen, like, Betty, she'll just catch you on to John one time because he didn't use his children enough and they were acting up, and um, her style of parenting is very Right. Right. Well, you know, I mean, if I, if, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, you know, one of my areas is is family, and you know, one of the one of the things that's interesting about that is that you know, she's Betty's coming along about at the time that we've got Dr. Spock as sort of the big yeah. expert in parenting, and it's all right. it's much more nurturing oriented, right? It's much more. So she's really deviating from you know that ideal type of parenting. She's almost bringing in a more old fashioned style of parenting. And, and I think that's. I think you bring along it, bring an excellent point. I mean, it's very detached. It's very remote. It's very punitive. And so I think you're seeing in Betty not so much what the ideal parent would be at the time, but rather that parent who's who's kind of numb because of her own depression and who's so self-absorbed and narcissistic, which is how you know Freudians would have described women at that time, women like Betty, that she can't necessarily you know reach out and do the things that she needs to do for her children, even as she's modeling this perfect this perfect wife. Does that help? I mean, that's my kind of answer, but mm -hmm. Elwood may have an answer too. So no, I, I kind of mentioned it in, in, in this essay. Yeah. Well. I mean, I how she very well, you remember one, of the, remember one of the episodes when she locked uh, Sally in the closet, mm -hmm. so to speak, and I think this it's clear because she's called her smoking a cigarette. And, I, and I, mm -hmm. my, my response is, you know, well, nobody's going to be happy to see their preteen daughter, even teenage children probably smoking, but the point is, parents who are better adjusted would find less, a less draconian way in trying to, you know, um, and she's constantly telling Don, um, and if you haven't got, you'll see some of this in season three without giving too much, because you're only in season two, but yeah, she's definitely one of those, um, uh, one of those kind of individuals who is, um, what we would consider today not necessarily the best parent. She's kind of detached from her children, yeah. and she, other people are raising her children, Carl in particular, and um, uh, just sees them almost as a significant uh, a, 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 a nuisance, but a necessary obligation. She probably, right, to, by today's standards, if, let's say she was living the characters in the 60s, I would say by the 21st century, Betty would probably be a woman who would not even have children. Because I think she doesn't really, I, I, I think that'd be safe to say, she probably wouldn't even have children today because she would be, there wouldn't be the same level of pressure to have right, them, so to speak. Right, right. I mean, that wouldn't be the fulfillment fulfillment of womanhood for her. And the other thing I would say that, that um, occurred to me is that, you know, this is a time when, um, you know, law was such that domestic, any sort of intimate violence, you know, intimate family violence was really not seen as, as worthy of public scrutiny. So, when, you know, she can lock her kid in the closet, you know, as long as the, as long as it doesn't, you know, physically super harm the child, you know, the child doesn't end up dead, there's not, there aren't going to be a lot of questions asked at this that particular a, period of time. This is a children have seen and not heard it. Right. And, and it's particularly a time when what's happening in the family is supposed to stay in the family and right. it's really not the purview of, of the public, um, which is, which is ironic because that's not really the, the, necessarily the historical way that people have dealt with things. But, um, but for that particular time, it's true. And so I think some of it too is that Betty can get away with a lot of things that, you know, if, if my daughter went to school and said, mommy locked me in the closet, which occasionally, you know, the thought has occurred to me, I have to say, because, you know, kids, I have a six-year-old, and she's, you know, you, know you, you think of things that you wouldn't do, but uh, don't worry, I'm really not going to do that. But I could get reported to social services for that, and I would be taken in, right? My child would be taken away. That's not going to happen to Betty, and particularly not because, not because she is an upper-middle-class white wife, you know? And also the point you make, too, is also, this is also the time, as Julie says very well, this is the time of Dr. Spock. A lot of psychology is really, psychology is really beginning to come into the mainstream. Right. You had Freud and stuff in the early 20th century, but psychology is, post-war, there's tons of magazines, mm -hmm. whether it's McCall's or, you know, whatever, you know, the Good House Keeping stuff. You, Life magazine, you can't even pick up a, 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 a magazine without some article, at least two, of a minimum of two articles or three, probably, talking about some aspect of child rearing. You know, because it's the baby boom, I and mean, children have people are having a lot of kids and stuff. Oh, good God, so it's yes. basically that. So yeah. it's a time where a lot of um, people like Betty are going to be talked to and be answered experiment, and that's it's the backdrop of all that that's yeah. going on as far as child psychology. Yeah. Other folks? Better show. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that um, I happened to see an episode <laughs> of it, and I was glued to the TV <laughs> because I grew up in that era, and I remember that era, and not only do they get the attitudes of the Mm -hmm. but from the, the clothing, the furnishings, the little objects, I mean, it's, it, I remember all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And thank God we're not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> it, 
<laughs> but you watch them anyway. Yeah. No, I watch yeah. it because I know people like that. Yeah. That you know right. of my parents' generation. Yeah. And um, yeah. That's why I'm so drawn to it because I I just can't believe how great they got that town. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really compelling. I think, and I'm I'm you know I was I mean I was born in 1962, so I don't remember so much the early part of the 60s, but I can remember my parents' conversations about them, and I can remember what my house looked like then, you know, things like that. And so you're right, you know, what my mom wore, you know, and and it, you know my life was very different in, in certain ways because my family wasn't, you know, my dad wasn't elite like her, but I think they do really get it right. But the thing I would I would really say is I think I think the cautionary tale in this series is that we also I mean we have to be really careful about thinking about our own double lives that we're leading now, the ways in which some of the things that we're doing seem so ideal. We have more freedom, and I definitely think it's better, I guess, from where I would sit, you know, as a, as a woman who's able to do a lot of things. But I also think they really, really call into question, you know, we sort of, we too have an idealized idea of what family is like, and we have people making, pretending that, and what's, what are we, what's that going to look like 50 years down the line? You know, what are we yeah. doing? Our, so I think it's important in, in that regard. Um, oh, uh, I think, Yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the season one episodes. They they really nobody comes off um, unscathed in this. They 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 really love to show you an American idealization and then show you how how, how um, problematic it is behind the scenes. You know, you have this moment where Roger Sterling and Don Draper and their wives are out to dinner, and Roger Sterling makes some comment about how he really wishes. You know, he doesn't know exactly where Don's from because Don's very guarded about this. But you know, wouldn't it have been great? You know. You know that earlier generation growing up in the country on a farm you know all these sorts of things it's the episode in uh, season one I think my old Kentucky home and then you're there just all of a sudden it's like Don flashes back to, to his own growing up in, in uh, rural Kentucky and it's filthy um, it's muddy the work is incredibly hard the animals are you know kicking you actually his his uh, birth father gets kicked to death by, by, by a horse we're trying to saddle a horse while drunk you know, it, it's, you know, disgusting. So, so even in the 1960s, you had kind of this suburban ideal, and then you had this also wistful looking back, oh, when we all lived out on the farm, that was great, right? Yeah. No, that wasn't well, great. It was, that was really hard work right. and kind of disgusting. And, and now we have, of course, that, you know, the looking back, you know, this, con I write on my other stuff, I write about the conversation about women who supposedly are opting out of the workforce and going back to have a more traditional love of home and hearth, which is actually, you know, data show is actually not true, but there's that sense, which, you know, we know people are looking back and saying, oh, if we could only go back to that time where gender roles were divided and everything was well organized, our lives would be more peaceful and pure. And this helps <laughs> us see, you know, that that isn't necessarily the case, even if what we have now isn't perfect either, right? So I think there is that sense which is forward looking and also retrospective. Um, and, I it's also, great, yeah. Yeah, exactly. and I think Matthew Weiner also does a good job. I think it's also the message was, I, um, was I was talking to somebody at the John City Press about this yesterday. Uh, the message is, you know, we've gone, uh, a lot of times we've certainly made progress, but sometimes we, 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 what's that old saying, two, you know, two steps forward, one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. And I think it also saying, because a lot of things were happening yeah. in the 60s, kind of are repeating themselves like right now. There's still women are still fighting to get some of those positions and CEOs are still, there's still very few women CEOs or very few CEOs of color, things like that. So a lot of those things that, you know, where games were made, they're still kind of, um, at least stabilize it very best, or in some cases might even be slightly retarding. You right. know, so I think that's, and I think that's the message yep. that Matthew, um, um, Wiener is uh, also saying in, 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 in a lot of it, in a lot of his, um, yeah. in a lot of his work. And yes, to the point you make, Julia, is excellent. Like a lot of times, people have this nostalgia. Some people have this nostalgia about you know, and go back to the quote unquote good old days. Well, if you weren't a white male, or even more specifically, a wealthy yeah. upper class able-bodied, heterosexual, Christian white male, life probably wasn't necessarily all that free for you to a degree. You know, you could probably disguise your religion if you were Jewish, somebody like that. but my point is, it wasn't yeah. that great. <laughs> so the point is, yeah. you know, that um, it, it, these things, you know, and I tell a lot of times, particularly with African-Americans, 
or people of color like that. You know, you're, 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 for a while, you're a lot of people saying, well, you know, the, the days of pre-integration, some people, not the majority, but smart segment will say, the days of pre well, no, I'm a historian, I'm telling you now, the days of pre-integration for black people in this country were not that great, okay? <laughs> I'm much sure I live in 2012 <laughs> to 1934, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you were, well, we didn't have Barnes Noble then, but no, this would not be an integrated cafe, okay? Yeah. You would not be sitting up here talking about, talking about mad men and talking about white anti-Semitism and racism. You probably, your, wife, your life could be in danger by even doing that, right. and you would not have an integrated panel up here talking about these type of things. That in itself would show you the kind of world we were living in then. And yes, there were a few black hotels, there were a few blacks, you know, business here and there, but by and large, the vast majority of black people did not live in freedom, and a lot of black people did not live in, 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 in you know, in lives that were really, really, you know, beneficial. And even those who lived segregated lives, you still had that mark of inferiority about you still were not able to, you were still a second class citizen. Now, some people, that was good enough for them, but I still think there was, I think integration certainly brought a lot more advantages. Oh, yeah. Then it did, then it did, then it did not, and also the same thing with women. And you know, I think so, so, I mean, so I, I definitely say yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, this yeah. that, that, those going back to those days of motherhood and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's better left in the past. Study it and learn from it. Yeah, you know. that's for sure. Yeah, she got another Go ahead, season two over there has another question. Um, so I know Betty, she goes to a place in the therapist. Uh huh. And the way it's treated in the show is that it's just really taboo to like even think about seeking psychiatric help. And then when she actually goes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it was very. I mean, that again, that was very, very kind of. I think of it as a hush, Freudian hush. method of of, anal of it was analysis. So you laid on the couch, you talked, and then the the analyst would hear what you had to say. There was no sort of give and take like there is in therapy now. I, I you know, the, and calls the, the, your husband with the result. Yeah. Right? That, that, How nice is that? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I, what I was, what I was, you're, you're exactly right. The thing, the thing I was going to do that probably won't, be, but I, I, contrasting that image with the image of the Bob Newhart show, which I don't know if you've ever seen, but it's this show about you know psychotherapy and you know Bob Newhart has people A laying on the couch, but he's much more. Show, yeah, yeah, so you can really, you can almost see that you know this as a, as a development. That's actually, it's, it's a really good point. But yeah, that's typical, and from what I understand, I mean, and, and also and, too, and without times. spoiling too much, um, you know, psychiatric care circa 1960, you, you get a much more graphic view in um, season six. You look forward to that. You'll get it in yeah. season three. You'll see, you'll yeah. see. Yeah. But also too, at that time, yeah, yeah. therapy and stuff had more of a stigma attached to it then. Yeah. You didn't, you know, those things were kept quiet. You know, you didn't know those things, but you just didn't know. Nowadays, people are not as, you know, people are quite open with people like, hey, you know, saying it was okay to go to the therapist if you needed. We don't have that same stigma attached to therapy as you did back then. It was almost like you did not talk about those type of things. Right. Yeah, because it's becoming the new in thing, right? Right. Curiosity. Right, right. But definitely not something a man would do. I mean, definitely it was very much, you know, aimed at sort of fixing, fixing, you know, women and making women sort of accept the the you know their their supposed inner maternal nature, this sort of balance. I mean, and so you know, definitely you know, Betty could do it, but Don definitely could not. You know, that would definitely you know that would have sent Don off the deep. That's probably worse than being gay or black in right. certain ways. The therapy was for a man. Right. That was the worst thing you could ever even you yeah. know. Get Much better to go. Well, we, I won't say what Roger does in in this particular season, which is a hoot. But you know, you'll you'll see. You got you you got there. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. And everybody needs therapy is Don. So. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have you. One of the criticisms I've, I've read is that Matthew Warner seems to be really almost overzealous in like portraying the destruction of the family, mm -hmm. like with divorce. And do you think that's like a valid criticism, or do you think divorce was that common? Because it's kind of don't consider the you know, divorce in the '60s was not as commonplace, right, and socially acceptable as it is today. And now, without spoiling too much, you've got Betty and Rogers. Right. Mm -hmm. Divorce number two. Right. I mean, you know, the stats would say, or, you know, the sort of research would say, you know, this was a time before no-fault divorce, and so it was much harder to get a divorce. And New York actually was a state where it was it, there, it was a fault-based state for a long time, even after no fault was allowed. So it was very difficult for people to get a divorce, but I definitely, you know, there's, there's this sense that there were a lot of people who were waiting to get divorced, and once the no-fault laws um, um, were enacted, you know, you sort of saw this rush of people, and then divorce has, has really tapered off, you know, in society. Um, you know, it is... You know, I can say too. You know, I, I mean, I having grown up with you know parents who were still married from that era and pretty happily, you know, and Joe's parents and stuff. I think it's it's possibly over. 
we don't see any examples of good marriages yet, although perhaps, you know, Don um, with, I can't think of what her name is, his new wife. Megan, Don and Megan, perhaps that one will turn into one that's a little bit more egalitarian and a little bit happier. Um, you know, there certainly isn't an image of anything in marriage as being happy, which I think is somewhat unfortunate. But it also, I think because of what he's trying to do, it's almost necessary that he do that because he's really trying to, you know, um, unpack what those kinds of marriages were like, you know. And he's not showing, you know, the, so, so I guess, I mean, yeah, it's probably a valid criticism but it's possibly necessary for what the series is trying to do you know certainly you know even at that time I mean you know we always talk about the fact that you know uh, you know nationally right now it's 43 percent at the time of no fall it was 50 percent of marriages were likely to end in divorce but that still means 50 percent of marriages were ones that stayed together and I don't think every single one of them was miserable and they were just doing it for the kids you know there are some that, some that work you know so and I, I also think that one thing that um is beginning that that the show oh, hints at but doesn't entirely get um, is how much that vision of 1960s marriages that that were staying together in the era before no fault divorce is colored by our desire to look at the 1960s through the experience of upper and middle class right. white people. Um, Good point. In in our chapter in the book, we actually do some of the data on how much more likely is a woman with children to be single not necessarily by status but but by fact you know mm -hmm. maybe the divorce is never actually legally carried out but the man is gone and she's at home working for money alone with children um and and it varies quite widely both by racial groups and, and by by so by, by socioeconomic right. and class, as, as so. it does today right i mean and so you're seeing you're seeing something that's going on in an upper class you know family or an elite family and that's the key i think what is it? i think again matthew we're focused on upper middle class people here too yeah. right. you know, and i think nelson rockefeller in 1960 couldn't even get the republican nomination because he had been divorced that was a stigma attached to him right, right. well the, but the you know and the angst that attaches to the idea that say don and betty would divorce that this is something kind of shocking that you know Helen Bishop's the only woman in the neighborhood who's divorced and now 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 us right is is driven in part by this desire to sort of see their group as normative right there are plenty of you know women who have children who are not in an active working marriage around Betty Draper but she doesn't see them right that's and right. what's the status of Carla's marriage we were told at one point that Carla has her own children Right. right, but what's and the as as we, don't, we don't. We never hear about a husband. Right, we, you know, right. And we never even tell about the children. But I, we know. Right. We up until mm -hmm. that point, I mean, we I, 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 yeah, Betty Betty had children, but never it took that last scene. It took <laughs> right. to, to, Tomorrowland season, right. the final season of episode four, where you know when she had that little when they spar in that kitchen. That's when she terminates, fires Carla. When she goes, you know, what are your children up to? Are they doctors or lawyers? So that's the only, that's the first time you even know Carla any reference to her children. You know, yeah. right. so, you know. So I mean, it was you know kind of an insult when Betty tells her. You yeah. know, you know. So yeah, we don't even know about you know. But again, that goes back to the marginalization and the blacks appeal on the periphery. Right. Yeah, and so the so show kind of shows, you know, yes, there's the impression that, oh, gosh, this is something new. These families are falling apart. Well, no, it's not, actually. It's quite common in American society even before then. Just it's hidden from view in some senses. I'm yeah, sorry. Go that ahead. Was super cool. I, I think the other thing, and, and I'm sorry this expands from your question and, and takes away from someone else's, but um, I, um, I think another thing about the series that's interesting is how it shows poor Betty after – after she and Don divorced, I mean, Don has, I mean, he's lied, I mean, he hasn't just lied to her, he hasn't just been unfaithful, he's lied about who he is, you know, and that's, that's really what gets them to divorce, you know, heck, I'd probably divorce him too, no offense, I hope you're not hiding anything, but, um, my real name is, yeah, is, is, yeah Dick Whitman, Dick Whitman. <laughs> yeah, um, but, um, but, you know, what's, what's so, people really don't like Betty Draper as a character precisely because she's such a horrid mother, I actually really have some sympathy for her. This is a Me trapped too. woman. This is a woman who is trapped. And what is her solution when she leaves Dawn? She has to go and get married again. That is what she sees as her solution. And that's where to I think... To a much older man. To, yeah, to a much older man who's, you know, pro very kind and everything. You know, certainly is probably going to prove to be a better husband than Dawn. But how sad, how sad is it and was it that that was the solution for a woman of her, you know, socioeconomic background was just that you had to get married again because there really wasn't any other legitimate option. She couldn't be that divorcee in the neighborhood. She couldn't be Peggy. She had to go find another man. And I, that, that to me that is one of the saddest outcomes of this, um, the series, not because Henry turns out to be a bad husband because he doesn't, but because it shows the, 
the time. The really. time and how awful that was. I mean, to me, to me as a person, not necessarily as a scholar, but you know, I could make that argument too. But as a person, it's really it's heartbreaking, and her character is heartbreaking to me. It is absolutely it is heartbreaking. You make a very good point. It's like people that the venom toward Betty Draper. I mean, because yeah. they always if you go on blogs and they've asked oh, people they've done polls of which character is the most you know you know one that people have and for a long time it's been Betty and Pete's up there too. I mean, he's not he's not number two, but I mean, but but you can almost understand why people don't. Well, I mean, my opinion they may not like Pete because Pete does things that are just not likable. But but I mean, but Betty, I was like the venom toward this woman. I mean, she's if anything, she's I, I have much a lot more sympathy for her because she's such a you know just a tormented character and a lot yeah. of the stuff you know she's dealing you know with just things that really yeah. you know stress. I mean, and granted, she's got the like a lot of people look at her well. I think you're saying a lot of people well because of well. I think so many people have this attitude. Well, she's wealthy and she's well taken care of. Blah, blah. What, why she, why does she have to be this way so to speak? I mean, you know, and I mean that's pretty much what some people say on the blog. Right. I was like, well, yeah, but it's, I mean, she's got. But look at the stuff she's had to deal with. Her husband has been dishonest to her and cheats on her. I mean, and you know, I mean, it's, it's never but, been really. You know, she's isolated from the other characters right. to, up to the season. Really, you know, you didn't know her. But I think there's sexism in that response. I mean, Indeed. there's sexism among Indeed. the people responding. I mean, they're holding the, the. You know, here we've got all these male characters who are cheating on their wives. You know, one who lies about his identity. You know, we've got Roger who's. You know, and you know, and and then Betty, who doesn't live up to that feminine ideal, she's the one who gets excoriated even among the viewers of the show. And so I think that you know, again, that shows a way in which we we can see, you know, that we haven't solved all the problems that the series portrays. You know, she's really good. She really killed. Them, so yeah. Other questions? Okay. Sorry, we'll talk. You know, we'll talk all day. <laughs> or nine, as the case may be. But I do. But I think, I think that's a, that's a, um. um Oh, very good. Who, who who else has seen the show before? I want to go. I was just curious. We had some other. What do you? Well, I mean, so we've seen the show. What do, what what is any episodes that you like about oh, the show? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's what season are you on? I've watched it all. You've watched Pretty it all. Today. Anybody else watched it all? I, I'm on episode three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what season are you up to? Two. Two. Season two. two and two. Oh. Okay, so okay, so a lot of you are uh, uh, come lately to the show, but, but that's good. That's but, I think, but that's another. I mean, it does, but, that, but, very, but I think the show does, like I said, it's um, uh, it's won a ton of Emmys. The Emmy Awards are this weekend, I believe, aren't they? Are they this coming Sunday night? Like, you know, so but they really, it's done a lot of um, it's really, really, you know, um, yeah. it's won best drama, I think, for the past four or five years. I don't know if it's been upset yet or not, but it's been consecutive. I mean, Peabody Awards. I mean, every yeah. major yeah. award you can get, the show's got. And, and I think Christina <laughs> Hendricks see. must have won. She won as Best Supporting Actress at one I think she point. Did. Yeah, she did. And I think one, she is. I think just, this is up this year. You know, she's yeah, she is. I'm just actually super. a little envious of the people who are behind because I actually think it it, it, it watches well. Uh, it was season three when we came in, right? And, and 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 it watches well when you can watch it like a novel, which is written in a novelistic fashion. When when you're not constrained by the idea that there's a week between episodes. You know, it was great going through seasons one, two, and three where it could be like, okay, well, that was a good one. I'll, I'll watch another one. Yeah, Joe you know, and I were and like, now oh. it's like I'm on this, this delay. You mean there are no oh. more? We were like, will <laughs> the no kids please, please, please stay asleep so we can watch two? You know, yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. when they oh, put on season, oh. season five was the year and a half before oh, it came. It was, that know? was the longest wait. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was so awful. And, it, you know, and I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it was agonizing. It was awful. Yeah. Isn't that sad, you know? That's why they call the term Maddox. You know, it's like, we call it the culture because it was just, it was such a, such a show. Like I said, you know, it's a very, it's a very addictive show. I mean, some people, we all have our shows, I guess, we like use. Somebody said they like, I heard somebody said they like Breaking Bad here or something. But, then, but, um, but I mean, some yeah. shows, you know, we were just, so a lot of us have shows, but I think this one, like, I think it's just on paper, because it took him actually been a while to get this. He's the one who did The Sopranos. He was actually the producer of The Sopranos, which is on HBO, wow. another very critically acclaimed show. Wow. But this one, he didn't get quite as readily done. A lot of people passed on it, because I think, um, looking at it on paper, and that, but people say, well, an advertising nineteen sixties. Uh, how? What's yeah. this going to be? I yeah. think they probably thought more like, a, yeah. you know, uh, you know, probably more like a father knows best kind of story. They probably didn't think it was going to be anything. But he said, you know, well, look, he said, give me a chance. He told AMC because they were a new network, you know, and they said, well, let me show you what it's about. And they let him give an idea what the scenery was going to be like in the background and all that. Yeah. And then, you know, when he saw it come to life, they said, oh yeah, we're signing up on this. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I mean, but uh, yeah, I think you know, so I think a lot of times things on paper don't necessarily transpire. Or, to, you know. I don't want to, you know, um, this is not academic in the least, but it's actually, uh, it, it's, it's one of those ways that I'm very much a fan as well as, as somebody who tries to analyze this. Um, cool, two, must be two of the coolest jobs to have in, in the country. Scott Wells, who's the set designer, and Amy Pohl, who's the, the uh, design kind of guru. I mean, I just wonder, how do they do this? Are they like out in every secondhand shop? <laughs> yeah. All over? California, like looking for couches. Um, you you want to go out and drive around today and look for couches, you know? How? Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The telephones and all that. Yeah. Where do they find this stuff? Uh, is there I mean, that's a job within itself. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was like, you know, being a war real because a lot of shows have war real consultants. I was like, yeah. you know, that'd be a dream oh, show to be a war consultant. Job. And so Ugly Betty, next Ugly Betty, I think they probably, who knows who, probably, who makes more. You know, because yeah. just, I mean, I think, you know, because being war yeah. because the war real consultants get their own, you know, they're, they're, there's so many people you got an outfit, and, yeah. you know, and they're wearing four or five outfits doing a show, you know, yeah. at least easily. So. And now I know Joe has an interest in decorating. So think about how <laughs> I can take care of that. Only if we get to make the house look like, you know, 1965. Sorry, I just had to get that in. Uh, this summer I was in uh, Brooklyn uh, <laughs> studying the Naval Yard. It's a vast yeah. right. industrial complex that's yeah. going down. And one of the companies there did TV sets, oh, especially wow. for Saturday Night Live and others. Yeah. And what they do is, they, you know, the episode, you've got the storyline, you build the TV set. In Brooklyn, you bring it in to the studio in Manhattan, you do the show, and you throw it away. Oh, interesting. Oh, disposable, like a diaper. That may help you understand that. Yeah. So you're, you're suggesting not a real couch well, I should sit on. It's all, <laughs> yeah. it's all. It's all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Like that. Yeah, that's I'm really, that's really. Cool. I have to go see if I can find it. See, yeah. you you'll you'll be in Brooklyn, you know, too. Brooklyn? So you, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's really cool. That's yeah. Because it, it, and it, and it really does help make the series just. So much more I did want to ask those of you who are two, three, uh, um, the, those who have not got up to the fa uh, season five yet or haven't got past the third season, do, do you think you'll, the fact you've watched the season two, obviously there's some interest in the show, but do you think you'll main, do you think you'll have the fortitude to get to season five or three <laughs> or four? I, I mean, is this something you think you're going to stay with? You are? How about yourself? So, I mean, because yeah. you never know what people think, yeah. you know, so, you know, you're up to date on it, so, you know, so, you know, yeah. you know, as well. So I was just curious of many people, you, do you think you'll stay with, you know, continue oh, watching? Yeah. Okay. And okay. what happens, AMC, I think, tends to air these shows right before the new season starts, they tend to do a marathon. You can get them on Netflix, and you also get them on DVD. And iTunes, so, yeah. And that's iTunes, so, I mean, there's definitely um, yeah. quick yeah. access. They took it off the air. Yeah. They took it off, and in the middle of it, they took it off, I was like, no! You, can, you can't do this to me, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And plus, it's fun. I mean, you know, there it, it is. It is one of those shows that you can watch again. You know, not every not every television show is made to watch more than once, but it is something that you can watch more than one time. So that's what that was our argument. That and I say, twenty years down the road, you're going to still oh, yeah. you're going to still look at Mad Men back. You know, they're going to look back at Mad Men and say. Um, a show um, you got to watch. I think, don't get me wrong, this is, AMC's got some good television, but I think shows like Breaking Bad and things, they're good, but I'm not sure they're going to have this, I mean, 20 years down the road, I think bad, people may talk about Breaking Bad, but I'm not sure. I think people will be talking about Mad Men 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, because of such a, um, uh, 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 I think it blends so many of those elements yeah. that are going to be part of the human social nature yeah. together. I'm not saying Breaking Bad doesn't have all that, but it doesn't have the, it's not as holistic. You know, Breaking Bad is more, you know, departmental. I think it's a but that's not I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas, yeah. yeah, and this, this, the good thing about Mad Men is it is a character study, and on top of it, it's a study of society. I mean, you can really see, you really see the layers of things that it's. Examining. It's an academic dream. Yeah, it is. And, you know, right we, because really, we need we need something to do that is not just reading text, and so you know, we, it gives us some a reason. And then we then we write about it, so you know that we feel justified in the many hours we've spent, you know, watching it over and over again. But it it is an academic dream, and I think it's you know it's an analyst dream. Well, and I guess, but like you've got, I mean, any, any, you could teach, you could pretty much put, um, Mad Men's the kind of show right now you, you could teach in a philosophy class. And actually, there was an anthology on philosophy and Mad right. Men, you know, by Mr. Irwin, a guy named Irwin, last name was Irwin, uh, Nate Irwin, I think. And then, you know, you look at it from, you know, sociologically, oh, sociolo you know, yeah, historically, sure, yeah. I'm talking about, you know, you know, uh, you know, as far as, you know, even political science, and as far as, you know, look at, you know, the, the, the politics, the Republican politics and all that. I mean, right. you could look at it, you know, from, you know, uh, anthropologically, you know, you look at focus on upper middle class people. And uh, I mean, there's so many elements of, you know, African American studies, you can look at on that, you know, right. gender study. I mean, there's, and not to make disciplines that really wouldn't economics that you could really you yeah. know put in yeah. and you you can you can use this the show can really touch I mean so very very multi sides in academia you couldn't find pretty much one of too many shows that you could be actually employ right. so many areas in academia right I, 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 I would I say many 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 other any other questions or comments anybody want to bring up about the um, what we had to say here one character you had mentioned is Anna mm -hmm. and I don't know maybe I just missed that episode I was never quite sure. Did she understand what happened in Korea? You, you never, never see, see it. Yeah. But I think the answer is yes. She does refer to him as Dick. We know that because when they sign the wall, that's right. Right. Um, that's he right. signs she his Dick. Because she tracked him down at the car dealership. Right. But but how much she knows about the details of this, I'm not sure. Yeah, they didn't really get into that. Mm -mm. Much. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an interesting thing about Don Draper that he has this real 
connection to this woman, feels very strongly about her, you know, just devastates him when he discovers that she's passed away. And, uh, and either coincidentally or probably more likely because it's really something very fundamental about him, you know, she's the one who knows the truth, the truth he can't find a way to tell anybody else. So the person with whom he's really most himself, so to speak, matters right. to him a great he deal. He treats her differently than he treats other women. Absolutely. Right. He looks at her right. totally differently. There's a level of authenticity there that he, he, he doesn't let the mask drop right. anywhere else. Right, and respect for her, although he then does go, you know, sleep with her daughter, but that's, you know, her, net, her, her niece. niece. That's right, her niece. Tries. But, but uh, yeah, but uh, but I think uh, it also and also one thing we didn't bring up tonight in the panel, you know, sex addiction. I mean, that's certainly something that looks at you know for different people, you know, um, you know exactly. That's 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 an issue that you know was um, again in the '60s, those kind of things are certainly prevalent, but we didn't they, they weren't acknowledged. Even today, people don't want to acknowledge that as much. Wouldn't know we want to, would want to, but and I think it looks at you know sex addiction there too, and those type of things that are going on, you yeah. know, and certainly Don would be classified as one. Pete. Mm, Roger borderline, but Don would probably be more. I think, you know, I think you know, you know, but I think would um, certainly you know be classified. Nobody would by the day, even yet days, anybody would say Don Don Draper was a sex addict. You know, you know, yeah. I, you know, we definitely would say that. You know, he's a sex addict. You know, I think that um, you know, and I guess Pete not as much. I think you, I, mean, I think he's more. You know, so but uh, he, but that's an issue we didn't. That's something that, that the show also doesn't. You know, um, gets into as well. You know, alcoholism and all those other things. As well, you know, that, yeah. it, it does as well, it's, you know, but, but it does, like I said, it's a show that's been very very. When it came out, you know, it's like anything else, you know, you could put AMC on the map, you know, <laughs> I think we, yeah. we think it's safe to say it's done that, yeah. and I think it's, um, yeah. you know, it's been a really, really a gem in many ways as well. Uh, any other questions or comments anybody bring up or anything? Any closing thoughts? Yeah. You go see them? Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> you know. I'm looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> well, good, definitely. <laughs> we recommend it high. Yeah, I'm trying to get my parents to watch it. So my, you know, I, I really like mom and dad, you have to, I mean, they, they I was in, my dad was, you know, in, in the Midwest, so it's very different. But I'm like, you just have to watch this show because I'm really dying to see what you all. They were a little bit younger than the Drapers, so they would have been about five years younger. But you, know, you do, you want to see it filtered through the eyes of someone who's of their generation at the same That's time, you know? Right. Yeah. And these, these. So yeah, so you'll, so that's right. So you will see it. Oh, that ought to be really fascinating. Yeah. And these people be, be the, these people be the silent generation. You know, these people be the, right before the baby boomers. Those people were born between 1924, 1925, uh, and 1945. That's a silent generation. These, that's Don. These people represent the silent generation. And I actually clued my mind. I said, if Carla was alive today, she'd be well past her time. She'd probably be in her early mid 80s. Carla would be about 83. Don Drake be what 85 today, probably for 84. They all be in her. They'd be octogenarians. You know, late late 70s. So they would be. Yeah. You know, it'd be interesting to see what they how they would respond to. Um, <laughs> um, um, you know, and it'd be, but I think I, I also say how I, conclude, how I conclude my essay with Carla here is like I said, I think in many ways, um, y'all probably want to buy the book now, but I'm sorry, you think about the essay. But I think that um, how I concluded is that I said that um, you know, what, what would she think of you know, um, uh, you know, uh, her generation was a generation of African Americans and then term Negroes who made a lot of sacrifices and deal, and that's what titled you know they endured a lot of you know uh, disrespect and, and, and injustices and things you know and silently uh, you know took a lot of uh, you know disrespectful behavior in an effort that the generations proceeding like my generation stuff they've given us opportunities that we would never even you know could even probably even, they could even dream of I mean President Barack Obama I mean in 1964 she as somebody told her about 40 years down the road Carla you're gonna see a man who's the same race as you is gonna be the president of the United States the cheetah probably thought you had lost your mind you know what I mean so I mean so I mean, so, I mean and that's uh, so I mean that, that that kind of you know the, and there are people like Carla who did take a lot of, you know, suffer a lot of, you know, because these people can be disrespectful. These, you know, black or are treated disrespectfully on some level. I mean, not maybe physically in this case, but no. they're treated, but they're, they're, they're ostracized and everything else. And they quietly accept a lot of that because they knew they did it in order for the next generation not to have to deal, you know, it's, you know they're, they're still Carlos today, don't get me wrong, or people are amazed, there's nothing wrong being amazed, you know, but my point is that, you know, now you can turn on television, you'll see Melissa Harris Perry, so you'll see, you know, people on TV, you know, who you would not have seen on the, night, on the, on the local news, the nightly news, or let alone President of the United States, or Lieutenant Governors of States, or, you know, Vice President of record companies, we have those things today, this doesn't mean things are perfect, but for African Americans, these things would have been in the imagination at best, and okay. you would not, the only time you would saw a black president on, uh, and it would have been on TV or in a fiction novel. And there were a few movies made, like James Earl Jones was the first black president in 1970, and those type of things. You know, Dana Dennis Hayes for 20, uh, yeah, 24. And that wasn't yeah, that all that long ago he was a black president. I mean, That's so right. that just showed you how, uh, the fact that we didn't even create a character like that showed you how far fetched that would have even been in 2000. And boom, you know, 2008, we have a man as well. So, you know, as a political scientist, you can speak to that. So yeah. Well, it's probably just chance. Uh, you wouldn't want to read too much into the, to the, 
fact, perhaps. But it is interesting to me that the the man who becomes the first black president of the United States is is a black man who grew up in Hawaii. And he, he comes out of the West. Maybe it was just as good a chance that the first black president of the United States would be somebody who had grown up on the, you know, had grown up in Brooklyn, perhaps, or had grown up in, in you know, uh, rural Alabama. But one of the few romances in, in the show that is not very romantic is the romance of the West, which holds, right? When, when Don's at his lowest points, he goes to California and he gets re-energized, he gets redeemed. There's this notion that in the United States, somehow going west frees you of all this stuff that's built up in the south and in the in northeast, the northeast yeah. and, and in the Midwest. The, this weight of accumulated cultural expectations, good and bad, that kind of hold you in place and force you to be this or be that. And it does play into that one American stereotype that somehow going west makes you free. Right? West, frontier. West, is, west is frontier, west is opportunity. Yeah, you you're, you're right. And, and, um, and I've sometimes wondered that about, about Obama, you know. It, was he growing up in Hawaii sort of felt less constrained by this notion of, you know, the, the, the roles you play as a black person, a white person, or whatever, well, because he's growing up well, in the West also, rather than in the East. It's interesting you said that because it, for what he's worth. The show I mean, seems to play into that idea, well, too. Well, they said he did studies for students on, like, you know, SAT tests and AC tests for what this is worth. Um, I, I don't think they have standardized tests, but they've taken studies, and the states where black students have had the highest ACT and SAT tests have been New Hampshire and Oregon. <laughs> now, I mean, one far west, one far north, right. where the black populations are relatively minimal. Right. So it does make you wonder, you know, with the west, is there that kind of, um, and they did, in the late 70s, they did studies, uh, uh, this is the late 70s, and you as a sociologist, you might be aware of this, they did studies about blacks in parts of the country, and blacks in the west seem to have a much more positive Right. Uh, outlook about things. People living in Colorado and uh, New Mexico and right. uh, Nevada, and it was interesting because we're, these are these are states where the, where the black populations are very minute. Latinos are the largest oh, yeah. states, so maybe there's something about the West and that frontier spirit. And right. you know, and I was talking about this in my class just the other night, my history class and my survey class. You got to realize people moving to the West at that time, it was more of a probably pioneer. You talk about people leaving, in, you know, the turn of the late 19th century, going out to a land. These weren't even states yet. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. going out to venturing out to unknown territory, didn't know they know what awaited them. So I mean, you know, uh, inclement weather and you know, print of no, you know, no trees, but, and, you know. So that shows you they had to be very, very resourceful people. But certainly, right. you know, if they were African American, you know, the, the options were probably at least they were at least there wasn't the constraint on. Well, the they said, what, you, you what could you do uh, the, there? Was, there uh, people yeah. had to survive for the winter. Right. right. And that skin color became second or third or whatever. Absolutely. You know, you know, we, we, we all got to survive. We had time to to look at that. So yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it too. But I think that's an interesting point, though. Why you know, you know, he's because he's from Hawaii, but he tend to always emphasize the Chicago right. aspect. I mean, he because he was born in Hawaii, you know. So you know, Hawaii. Hawaii. Barnes and Noble customers. So. Barnes and Noble is now closed. Well, dang. Uh, <laughs> well, we thank you. <laughs> Well, we thank you all for coming. So. Thank you thank so you much. So we much. appreciate you coming. Thank you. That's great.